Good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Every so often, the West Coast tech giants are hauled over to the East Coast of the United States for a ritual humiliation at the hands of the US Senate. They land a few punches, they get punched a few times, a few headlines get generated, and you end up with some very powerful people looking pretty uncomfortable, but nothing normally really changes. When it comes to an issue as serious as child abuse, it surely has to. Yesterday, the head honchos of tech giants, including Meta, TikTok, Snapchat and X, appeared in Congress to face questions on the serious harm their products are causing to children. Some of the exchanges were toe-curling, none more so than the moment Mark Zuckerberg, who runs Meta, which is Facebook and Instagram, attempted to explain why some content flagged as child abuse on Instagram somehow remains available to view. This material wasn't just living on the dark corners of Instagram. Instagram was helping pedophiles find it by promoting graphic hashtags, including hashtag ped whore and hashtag preteen sex to potential buyers. Instagram also displayed the following warning screen to individuals who were searching for child abuse material. These results may contain images of child sexual abuse. And then you gave users two choices. Get resources or see results anyway. Mr. Zuckerberg, what the hell were you thinking? All right, Senator. Um, the, the, the basic science behind that is that when people are searching for something that is problematic, it's often helpful to, rather than just blocking it, to help direct them towards something that um, that could be helpful for getting them to get help. In what I also... understand, get resources. In what sane universe is there a link for C results anyway? Well, because we might be wrong. Well, yeah, you might be, but really, that's the excuse. Surely, if there is any risk whatsoever that images of child abuse are being shared. They must be instantly removed. How can any sane person argue otherwise? Senator Lindsey Graham was loudly cheered by watching parents when he said this. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. Well, he has a product that's incredibly popular and it's made him incredibly rich. A lot of people use Facebook very safely, and there's no problem with that. It's one of the most successful companies in history. But the people that were cheering there were parents whose children had been victims of horrific exploitation on those platforms, or whose children had taken their lives. Well, Mark Zuckerberg made this apology. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I'm sure everything that you've all gone through is terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. And this is why we invest so much and are going to continue doing industry-leading efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Well, despite his rather unfortunate tendency to look and sound like an AI-generated lawyer, I do believe Mark Zuckerberg wants his products to be a force for good in the world. And at least he had the decency to turn around and apologise to those parents. He wasn't by any means the only tech giant boss there. They were all there. But he was the one that did that and credit to him for doing so. This is the way the modern world communicates. It's where we're entertained and educated, social media. It's integral to our lives. It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to get bigger and bigger. That's exactly why we need to trust that the people in charge of it know what they're doing and do it properly. One thing they're very good at is keeping us safe from content they find distasteful. We might remember the scandal of the Hunter Biden laptop, which disappeared from your Facebook news feed, disappeared from Twitter, it was called then, deliberately censored by big tech. And as a result, Joe Biden won the election. And we'll never know whether the scandal, had it been properly allowed to permeate through social media, because it was all true, might have tipped the balance towards Donald Trump to serve a second term. And yet, ironically, Facebook, along with others, moved quickly to ban Trump himself from their platforms for three years. 
Well, currently, uh, the Piers Morgan Uncensored Facebook page appears to have been shadow banned too. This is a regular occurrence where if they don't really like the look of some content, they just downplay it for the audience so that people don't see it. I don't think that's right. I think that's a form of censorship too. Meta makes $100 billion a year profit. It's time to invest less of it in sanitizing opinions and more on keeping children safe. And that applies to all those other platforms too. Well, to discuss that, and more, I'm joined by Seth Dillon, CEO of the satirical news site Babylon B, the computer scientist and author of Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, Darren Lanier, and the entrepreneur and host of Roundtable, Mario Northall. Well, welcome to you. It's a pretty star-studded uh, tech pack, this, actually. Let me start with you, Seth. Um, CEO of Babylon B, hugely successful uh, digital platform. When you watched all these guys like Zuckerberg yesterday squirming away and being held to account by people who've, you know, suffered serious harm, lost their children in some cases, what did you feel about that? Well, you know, I don't take pleasure in them uh, suffering through a, a moment like that. I mean, obviously, I don't think that they feel good about the fact that there are kids who have committed suicide or have dealt with bullying and harassment or who have had who have had exploitative material of them shared online i don't think that they feel good about that but they they do bear some responsibility for it in the sense that their platforms are doing a very poor job of policing themselves and taking these things down they care a lot more about jokes that they don't like apparently than they do about content like this because they catch that stuff and take it down right away and sometimes these uh sometimes this content this really offensive or unlawful content stays up for an extended period of time and it's difficult for them to get it down so they do have some explaining to do uh, but i don't feel good about seeing them raked over the coals for it I, i'd like to see some actual solutions rather than just these conversations where we they show up and we throw some punches at them and they leave a little bruised and battered but don't do anything about it yeah i mean mario i, I follow your stuff on x and you're a, a relentless uh tweeter you tweet a lot of exciting stuff and it you know, a lot of it's very interesting um a lot of it's pretty full on i, I would argue as well uh, probably more for an adult a consumer, then I would feel comfortable with a child uh, following some of it because, you know, you cover wars and everything else. But do you think there's a line? I mean, is there a limit to what should be put on these platforms? There is, but who's to decide those limits? Like, that hearing was a circus. You got the same people behind... So someone just called me, I apologise. So you got the same people behind a lot of these... and um, oh, put focus mode. You're getting a lot, a lot of, of this censorship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so sorry, I just put it on Do Not Disturb. So the same people behind the censorship, so censoring information about COVID that they call misinformation, censoring information when it comes to election interference and what they consider to be um, misinformation again. And now they're using a topic that is the right thing to censor, it's illegal content, but suddenly they care. And you got senators, Elizabeth Warren, Mark Warner, Amy Klobuchar, they were behind a lot of that censorship over the last few years, right. but now suddenly they need to censor certain content. It's illegal and social media companies need to do more. I just find it ridiculous. Do you self-censor? I mean, is there a lot of stuff you don't post because you think actually younger people shouldn't see this? Mm, our audience is not younger people. So if you want to hold me as... But how do you know that? A exactly. So it's difficult for me. So my content is out there. How do you prevent young people from seeing that content? Obviously, banning children from getting to social media companies, which some people propose, is a stupid idea. You've tried banning children from porn websites. All you do is get a disclaimer. Are you above the age right. of 18? Yes or no? That's it. That's not going to work. So the solution, in my opinion, is a lot trickier than what these guys make it out to be. And you've got these senators essentially using this as an opportunity to show that they care. But the, the bigger agenda is not child exploitation. They don't care as much as they show it. They care about their, their, their specific agendas, yet they're trying to sneak in under the umbrella of censoring content like child porn, which should be censored. Right. Let me bring in uh, Jaron Leonard. Jaron, you're a, a, a computer scientist. You've done a lot of research into this kind of thing. I, I've been struck by that there's been an epidemic of anxiety about, amongst young people around the world, at precisely the same period of time in, in society when there's been an explosion in social media and the ready availability of what I would call dopamine hit material of all kinds, whether it's pornography, whether it's warfare, whatever it is, it's constant. And they're sharing it and they're being exposed to it. You know, I get exposed to it and I'm 58 years old 
And I know it has a bit of an effect on me sometimes. You know, during the mm. Israel Hamas war, it's been really harrowing to see this stuff just bombarding my senses. So God knows what it's like for an 18 year old, a 19 year old. Um, do you think there's a, a link here between this eruption of anxiety that young people are suffering and this constant feed they're getting of, of dangerous or unsettling or illegal imagery? Almost all researchers, whether they're coming from the left or the right, have come to the conclusion that it does do damage. And, and by the way, I want to say I'm kind of more from the left than you guys. And I'm kind of happy we have an issue where we meet here. I think that's healthy. And maybe that's a gift tech is bringing to us. Uh, in my view, the root problem here is actually just one law that could be changed that's not serving anybody. And it's called Section 230. And what it does is it treats uh, internet hubs as if they were phone companies instead of publishers. And the problem with that is something nobody saw. I was around when we started this, so um, I've, I share part of the blame perhaps, but if you remove enough liability from the internet platforms, it means that their competitors can kind of put out the same th stuff that they put out. So the only business model they have is to gain what we call network effect, which is a kind of monopoly, and then to sell uh, influence and routing of information or basically to sell virality through algorithms. And then the problem with that is virality runs on the fight or flight mechanisms of the human brain and it tends to make everybody a little more nervous and cranky and uh, vain and uh, you know all of those things. We see it more easily in our ideological opponents, but the truth is it affects all of us uh, pretty equally. Mm. Uh, so what I'd like to see is just simply to change that law. And I think what you'll see is the good side of social media, which is very real, have more of a chance and the incentives for the stupid stuff to be reduced. And I think all of us will be happy. And by the way, to my co-panelists, I think you'll do better in business in that world. You might not agree, but I think if it happens, you'll discover that. So I, I really want to encourage everybody to look at this win win scenario, which is just getting rid of one stupid law. It's very rare we have such an easy path. Yeah, but I, yeah. I actually think my observation um, of the extremities on social media is that the extreme left and extreme right can be as bad as each other with the clip baking, baiting and the way they go about it. I don't think there's much difference from what I've seen. Oh, uh, my Seth, God, yes. Seth, let me bring you back on, on another point, which is how much should parents be taking responsibility for enabling their kids to have the phones to get access to all this stuff? Well, I think this is where the problem starts. It starts at home. It starts with how parents raise their kids and what they put in front of them. You know, the, my comment on this uh, when I first saw the you know hearings happening was that you know it's it, certainly these are dangerous platforms. They're they're dangerous even for adults to be on these platforms and. It's okay for us to have exposure to some dangerous things because we're adults and we know how to deal with it. But what are you doing as a parent putting something dangerous like that into the hands of your own child and then just setting them free to go use that device while you, you know, do your own thing and don't have to worry about you parenting your child because they're entertained on this device for hours. That's having very damaging effects on kids. Kids are getting cell phones in their hands when they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Yeah. They're not prepared to encounter the content that they encounter there. The algorithms are designed to suck those kids in and make them addicted to that to that content. Uh, it has very, very damaging effects. So parents, that's the first line of defense is parents. There are plenty of apps that enable parents to control that stuff. Parents shouldn't be putting the devices in their hands in the first place. Uh, but they feel pressured to because all the other kids have them. But that's that's just parenting 101. Mario, what do you think of that? They're finding ways around it. It's a lot more complex, Seth. Like, you know, it's, it's always easy to blame the parent, but there's only so much they could do. There's apps to block certain websites, to block certain apps, but there's ways around it. And, and these children are smarter than their parents in finding ways around it. So I think social sure, media companies, well, I think that's the first line yeah, of defense, not the whole, it's it not the the whole answer. Agree, agree. But what, what's happening here is that this hearing is focusing on, on the social media companies censoring the children, which I think there should be some level of censorship. But I think censorship isn't the solution. I think focusing on the source is the solution. I remember Elon Musk was talking about this when no one was, and he was being criticized for it. We did a space about it in the early days, and no one really cared about it. The media barely covered it. Now suddenly it's a big deal. Great. Finally, they're paying attention after Wall Street Journal and other publications did um, um, uh, did hippie, or not hippie, so I'd say, did uh, analysis on this. But now starting to talk about the only solution being social media companies censoring further more than the censorship than we have now rather than focusing on the source itself is i think going to lead to bigger problems we're just seeing it's like everything is solved through censorship and i think that's dangerous yeah i think you make a good point uh jaron 
Let's talk about one social media platform in particular, because it's the biggest news source now for young people in the world. It's TikTok. And, of course, it originates from China. A lot of concern mm -hmm. about what may be going on there, what the Chinese may be up to. Um, a lot of concern about the effect it's having on society and on young people in particular. What do you think of TikTok? Oh, my God. You know, look... Uh I'm about to trash TikTok, so I want to put in one positive sentence. I actually like a lot of the stuff on it. I like TikTok dance culture. Hate me if you want for that. So <laughs> I'm not anti-youth culture. But, I mean, my God, look at the difference between the version of TikTok in China and the version externally. One is obviously designed to improve society and one is designed to harm society. Uh, because we don't get access to the data, because the thing's a black box, ultimately, it's almost impossible to really, really know what's going on, what's intentional, what's sneaky, and what's mm -hmm. not. Um, I have talked to prominent people in Chinese uh, government and industry circles who bring up uh, their century of humiliation, the opium wars, uh, and I get the impression that for some in China, this might be viewed as kind of fair play of a kind of a reflecting back to us what was done to them in what was for them a very recent memory, even though for us it feels pretty obscure. I don't, but I can't know, you know, this is the thing that's so frustrating is that um, there is really no way to know for sure what's going on, except we can say that uniformly people who study it Think that TikTok is mostly doing harm. Yeah. It's obviously it's a mixed story. There's some good stuff on it, but I just think it's intolerable. I think it's a horrible, a horrible, horrible thing, and something has to be done about it. Um, I don't like censorship any more than my fellow panelists do, but I also think we can remove the business incentives for the worst content, which is a different issue, and at least that ought to help a lot. Well, one thing I think that does help is talking about it, uh, and I appreciate all three of you joining me for a really interesting panel. Thank you very much indeed.